What is up guys? Welcome back to another Inscape tutorial. In this tutorial we're looking at all the visual settings that you could possibly mess with when it comes with Inscape and everything that you might want to tweak to get your image and your scene looking exactly like you want it to. So I will say before we get into it, if you do at any point learn something, please demolish that like button. That really helps. Just demolish it. Definitely, definitely helps. I am going to pull the settings in for Inkscape. And what I've done first is I've gone to presets and reset the default. And so now we are working with the out of the box template. We are working with the out of the box template of Inkscape settings. This is what you'll see in your scene as far as settings goes whenever you first launch Inkscape. And for just for reference, I'm in the sample project for Inkscape. So this is free online. You can find it on their website. It's a great example, good sample to see everything for the most part that Inkscape can do materiality wise and settings. So we're going to go over all of these different visual settings because Quite frankly, there's there's a lot. There's a bunch that you need to know about. There's a lot of things you're gonna have to tweak to make it look like you want. So let's jump right into it. The first thing I'm going to start with is actually the rendering quality. And I'm, I'm starting with this because I wanna show you the different types of quality that you can achieve based on this setting. So this is high, it looks fine. There's nothing wrong with this. Uh, I'll go ahead and put this on draft and you'll see a, a drastic difference. So when I put this on draft, it's it's changing out a lot of the materials to some default white. It's kind of removing the texture, the depth, the bump to a lot of these different textures. It's basically just looking at your scene. And maybe I would do this if you have a giant scene and you know that it's absolutely crazy. It's hard to run. You know your PC can't handle it. But I wouldn't get really hung up on that so much because Inkscape is pretty easy to run. You don't need to have the best spec PC, nothing like that. And we, as we increase here, we can start to see a little more detail in all these different materials. Medium, not a lot different, but you know, you can see start. We can start to see a difference. I would take note of the ceiling. The ceiling is currently white, but as I change this to high, we can see great difference. And that's basically the introduction of shadows. So high really starts to get into some of the really the bare bones of having shadows in your scene. And finally, ultra. It's gonna not, not gonna be a big difference between high, but it's gonna take everything up one more step. And the reason I started with rendering quality is I'm going to leave the render quality on ultra for the remainder of this video and probably for the rest of the time I use Enscape ever. Because honestly, I've never encountered a time where I needed to use anything other than ultra. I, and believe me, I worked in some giant models and giant models with lots of detailed materials. So having this on ultra and being able to run an ultra, even on crazy high textured models is awesome. And so I would tell you, keep it on ultra. So you never have to even forget to change it back. So let's leave that on ultra. So now I'm going to go back to the very top here, looking at style outlines, outlines, they're at 0%. And as I move this up, you can see that I start to see outlines around all the edges, essentially highlighting every edge of really any model in my entire scene. This applies to doors, this applies to everything, every edge in my scene. And so as this goes higher, you can start to see this, these outlines become even more bold, the higher percentage. And finally, when I put it at 100%, it looks like I drew this with a freaking Sharpie. You know, <laughs> I can see why you might want some sort of effect like this because it looks kind of cartoony and fun, but Honestly, I don't, I'm not a big fan of this and it's mainly because I'm not a big SketchUp user and SketchUp has all the outlines all the time and honestly, if you're familiar with SketchUp and want that look, use outlines, I guess. So I like to keep my outlines generally at zero, but I found the sweet spot for really crisp renderings if you want a realistic looking image that is, is put your outlines somewhere between two and five percent and I, that sounds kind of silly to put it at such a low number, but just having it, just introducing these outlines into your scene, just barely crisps up the edge of all the elements to the point where they pop, 
but they don't look unnatural. It, looks, it doesn't look too weird, like you have this giant bold line on all your edges. So I like them there. I'm going to keep them at five for the duration of this video, just so you can see things pop a little better. So before we move on to anything else, I want to mention this, and this applies to every slider. So what I can do is, you can see I've got my slider, and of course I can click anywhere on the line, and it'll it'll move it all up by a, per, a, a percentage. Some are different, they'll move up one percentage, some will move up five, whatever it is. Again, I'm gonna leave that at five, but something you can do is you can hover over any part of this line, and I can actually scroll up or down with my middle mouse button, and simply increase this by the same increments. Again, we'll go to other uh, sliders within the visual settings, you'll see they jump faster than 1%, maybe it's 5% or something, but there's a standard increment, and it, it's really nice if you're trying to you know, precisely tweak, maybe, you, maybe you're OCD like me and you want it on increments of 5 or something like that. You could always do that. So let's say we have this somewhere here at 73%, and I'm, I'm, I want this to be default. I don't know what the default is, but I just want this to be default. But you, you can double click the, this slider itself, the button on the slider, and that will return to the default value for that particular slider. That's not resetting everything, just that slider. And again, the default for the outlines is 0%, so that's why it's there. So I'm going to scroll it back up to 5. Something also you can do, if you over here on the, the right side of all of these different sliders, you can see these three lines. You have, you have a reset the default, which again, we just did through double-clicking the slider itself, which it seems kind of easy to me easier in my mind, or you can set value. So maybe you want an exact value, and again, we can maybe do something weird here. Let's do 11.25, great. Well, it doesn't matter. It's still gonna show up as 11.25 here, but it's just gonna do 11. I would just, I'd worry about integers. It's just gonna matter a lot more and be a lot easier. Honestly, I can't say that I've really ever used the set value because I'm happy enough just scrolling along here and putting in a particular number that way. So I want to scroll back to 5% in that case. Moving on, mode. So currently there's no mode, a specific mode set. So it's just, it's looking at the appearance tab of all my materials, showing me all those materials like they would show up normally. Great. We look at the other modes, we've got white. And as soon as I click white, everything in the whole scene becomes white. I will note that the water is not white and that's because it's water. Uh, every Inkscape material, I think it's water, grass, things like that that are automatically rendered for you in Inkscape based on a certain name that you have in the material itself will no longer, they won't render as white in white mode. Doesn't matter, not a big deal. Don't worry about that so much. But I would use white if I'm in a schematic design model and I'm not trying to get the client hung up on all the different materials that you may or may not even have already applied to your project. That's why I would use white. It's great. It's going to make everything white. Polystyrol. This is going to look a lot like white. And I can't say that I use this mode a whole lot because of what it is. I would probably just use the white mode. So polystyrol is it's a particular element and it's, it's more like a foam element and a foam polymer. And the idea is that it's pretty malleable, but whenever you choose polystyrol mode, You'll have this transmission slider pop up and the idea is that based on the amount of transmission percentage you set this at more light will actually go through the material so all these walls and everything as I move this up and it's gonna be really hard to tell but you can kind of see in some areas up here where there's an increased level of light and that's just because more light is able to physically transmit through that material when I put it at zero you can see some alteration there again I don't necessarily like this mode, that's just a personal opinion of mine, I don't use it, never have, but that's what it is. And looking at light view, light view is very interesting because it, it does exactly what it does. It, it tells you the light levels based on the brightness, it gives you actual lux up here and this is based on all your settings that you have in Revit, all the the actual light values and everything, the sun, this is the value of the sun, the light of the sun coming down outside. When I mean, you've got an automatic scale, and as soon as I do that, I am I can actually set my scale up here. So maybe I want to see everything within a certain range of lux. And you can see all my values start to change as I'm changing this, this scale. And again, these numbers up here, here are related to the numbers up there. 
Again, they're just rounded, but you can start to see and get a scale of the light that's in your scene. And I, I don't use this all that often, but I do like to use this kind of more just on the fly as I'm trying to do lights and perfect lights in my scene just to determine where my higher light levels are and where my lower are. So clearly we can see outside on the blank surface with nothing overhead, it's very bright, 100% sunlight, it's maxed. Over here up in this corner, well, clearly there's no direct sunlight and there's very little ambient light hitting that. So it's very dark and it's gonna fall closer to the left side of the scale. Again, just use it as you want. It's more of a reference that I use to tell me where I might need some extra light. Perfect. Again, I'm gonna put that back on none so we can see our scene, but it looks like normally. Moving down to camera, this is gonna be, you, if you start to change the exposure, it's going to be the bane of your Inkscape experience. And I will say that light in general is the bane of my Inkscape experience. And it does, while that is the case, it's not the end of the world. So my hope is that through all these visual settings that you can manipulate the light based on whatever you're looking at throughout any scene that you're working with, it's just gonna take some tweaking. So looking at camera, I've got auto exposure checked. So what is auto exposure? Well, auto exposure, well first, what is exposure? Exposure is how bright, how much white is in your scene. And as I increase the exposure, you can see how much brighter my scene naturally looks. Like that looks absurd, it's completely blown out, it looks terrible. So I'm gonna put that back to default. And again, I could remove some of that light and white to where it's almost pitch black and it looks kind of stupid. Again, default, keep that at 50% for now. But first I wanna explain what auto exposure is. So as you, you'll see, as I move throughout my scene, the exposure or let's just call it overall balance of light is going to be, in this case, balanced because I have auto exposure checked. So what auto exposure is doing is that every time I change my camera view, what I'm looking at, even just a minute little bit, it's going to recompute the light to balance it out. And by recompute, I'm, I'm saying the light is going to be balanced throughout the scene. You won't have any super, super dark or super, super light areas. So basically, you'll be able to see everything, which is kind of helpful. And I tend to run with auto exposure on most of the time just so I can see what I'm doing because again, the light levels are crazy different in this corner versus outside. So you'll notice as I move and I look over here, we can clearly see I'm moving towards a darker area. And as soon as I stop, the light is going to balance out ever so slightly. And I can really start to look at this as I get into some darker areas. So let's actually go up into this corner. And as I do this, we can see that the light balances out ever so slightly. And once I look back at something really bright, all the light balances barely. You could barely see that as soon as I'm looking at something really bright, bright, the light will rebalance. Again, looking inside versus outside, the light will shift as I move to balance out what I'm looking at so it's not too dark. So the doors in here look too dark to look at, but as I move in here, you can see they start to brighten up. And that's the auto exposure at work. Now that's all great, but it turns out what auto exposure is doing is essentially removing the specific values of light that you give, you know, random light bulbs, lights that you have in your scene. It's essentially balancing it out and kind of doing that for you, which in most cases is fine. I don't necessarily like to use it when I'm trying to create renderings. And the reason is, if you're using auto exposure all the time, again, it's not using the lights in your scene as the values that they are. So it's kind of a false, false level of light that you may be receiving from that particular light at that time. So what I like to do is turn auto exposure off. Now, what is this going to do? So everything got a little brighter and everything got brighter because, you know, there's windows right here on the south side. I've got wind, I've got direct sunlight nearly coming into the space. I've got more ambient light because I've got light bouncing off of everything. It's not balanced this out for me. It has not yet balanced this scene out for me. And so the, the reason I would like to use and render with auto exposure off is that now I can 
I can actually manipulate the light levels as they are in my scene and as I set them in Revit. And you'll also notice as I move throughout the scene, and even as I move towards this dark door, it's really dark, and it's still really dark. And that's because I haven't turned auto exposure on. This is actually how dark it is back here, and it's clear because there's no light back here. Like, why would it be bright back here? So that something like this tells me I clearly need a light there. You know, I could also look back at my light mode and do that. But you'll watch as soon as I put auto exposure on, it's going to balance out the light so I can see everything just like that. So I can clear it right there. I can clearly see these doors come back to life. Great. But I turn this auto exposure off and boom, the lights, the lights go out. Well, that's because, again, there are no lights here. So I like to use auto exposure whenever I'm just running around my scene and trying to look at everything and see what's there. But a lot of times you're better off not running around with auto exposure on just so you can see what the light levels are actually like. So I can clearly see, you know, it looks pretty good up here. I, I see all the light. It makes sense. There's a lot of open space. Perfect. But again, down here, it's pretty dark. So I'm probably need to add a light. You're mainly using that or not using that based on seeing real light values as they are in Revit or not. So auto exposure, I'm going to leave it on for now. We might, we might change it all in the future. So projection. Projection is basically the camera. Is it in perspective or is it in two-point perspective? Or is it, or is it in orthographic mode? Uh, Inkscape 2.7 introduced orthographic mode. So when I put this into two-point pers two perspective, you can see all of my verticals actually became vertical. If I move this back to perspective, you can see... There's a slight angle here. It looks kind of, it's hard to tell, but everything is slightly angled. So the thing I like to do, and I'm gonna go ahead and press H so we could see it up here at the top, for there's perspective and fly mode. So the first thing I like to do is go to walk mode. Let's say I wanna take a rendering from this place. I wanna go to walk mode, I wanna be on the ground, I just wanna know that. So I'm gonna see the feet, but then I'm probably in perspective so I can fly around and actually see things normally, but if I'm taking a rendering from the ground level, and this mainly only applies at the ground level because of perspective, the two-point perspective is going to be based on where your eyes are at or where the user's eyes are at, basically at ground level, creating that two-point perspective. And this looks really nice because right now, every vertical is vertical, and that's the only way you're going to get it to look that way is two-point perspective view. So we also have the option of messing with the depth of field. The depth of field, of course, is set to 0%, and I can change this to any value between 0 and 100. And so what is this doing? This is changing the depth at which I'm focusing at. So basically, 0 is, for all intents and purposes, infinity, which is you know, probably what you want, but maybe maybe this is you're treating this as some sort of camera and so you're you're choosing to focus on the interior you want a more natural looking shot as this as if this were from a camera you might put this at 10 15 percent so as you look outside it looks a bit blurry so i'm everything outside looks a little blurrier but everything in the foreground is really crisp it's really in focus and you can get as drastic as you want if you want to simply focus on the couch that's right here or this end of the couch and it just it gets even crazier. Not a lot, I don't use depth of field a lot. I use it here and there when it comes to rendering just to blur out some of the background if I want to redirect the focus, maybe on the, to the interior in this case. That's depth of field. Autofocus. I can't remember a time where I've run around without autofocus on. And finally, orthographic. As soon as I hit orthographic, I'm like shot out <laughs> into the middle of nowhere. And if you remember my Inkscape 2.7 update video, you can see everything that has to do with the orthographic view. It's really great. So this is as if, you know, orthographic is basically what Revit uses to show models. It's all an orthographic view, which means everything is in scale regardless of what you're looking at. So there's no real perspective to it in that case. It's just all orthographic. And so that's why everything looks so weird and it's really hard to navigate throughout the scene this way. Could see I'm having a lot of trouble and so I would almost never bother being in this mode trying to, to look and move around except I might orbit around that seems to make sense I can do that at least kind of like you wouldn't rev it that's nice but the only thing I would do is hit the number keys eight five or eight four two and three that'll give you different views 
in this case this is the back view and then the side view the other side view and then like the front here that's great these are nice elevation views so I you know I would use it for that um, other than that I don't see myself using orthographic view all that much but that's nonetheless that's what it is going back to perspective I'm gonna go back to my view in the inside so looking at autofocus I can't tell if this is a bug or something but I don't have the option of unchecking this and if you look at the tooltip at the bottom it says automatically sets the focal point to the object at the center of the view and this is disabled in orthographic projection okay if this is disabled then great all that tells me is that I should be able to control it otherwise but in perspective or two-point perspective I can't change it I can't change it regardless and even in orthographic it is still checked I don't know beats me I'm gonna skip it for now so basically just kinda know that everything's gonna autofocus which it's not a bad thing you know it's fine that that's working and then we have the focal point the focal point down here you know, I'm in perspective view I am stuck at zero I, I can't change that again kinda of the autofocus thing but the field of view I can this is somewhat useful um, I will say that the default is 90 and that's it's set at horizontal and that is because that is the field of vision of humans so if you imagine the 90 degrees that we can see that's what this is referring to so if you change this to a different value let's kind of let's lower this a bit now we're seeing a, a smaller angle of you know the, everything if you imagine 180 degrees being everything from beside you all the way in front of you then that would be 180 degrees but as we reduce this below 90 we start to see less and less and less so I'm technically still standing in the same place but what I can see is way way different it's it's technically much much smaller and that's it's zoomed in that's because of the changing of the field of view so I can get all the way to 10% which is kind of absurd if you want to zoom in on something great do that I don't know but if I go past 90 things start to look weird and they start to look weird because it's simply unnatural we're not used to being able to see so wide really beyond 90 I think I want to say the widest I've ever gone is maybe 100 you can almost get away with this looking somewhat normal but still like even if I put it at two-point perspective it kind of looks a little extreme because like you see more out here but as soon as I put this back to default like, like when I put this at 100 you can see the flowers and if I put it at 90, you can't see the flowers because it's just the field of view, and that makes sense. So that is the field of view. That is everything on the rendering tab. I can't believe we finished that finally. Things start to get more hairy as soon as I click image. So when I click image, I've got contrast. And again, these are all the defaults. By default, the highlights and shadows are at 0%. That's great. You could also just say, nah, forget it. I'm going to click auto contrast and it's gonna do whatever it wants to do that's great okay not a big deal again that's kind of being similar to the auto exposure because it's just gonna literally set that regardless of what you're looking at So I'm gonna get back to my location here and so a lot of times I'll turn that off because maybe I've got shadows that I maybe I want to increase the shadows okay well I can I can do them this way well they're clearly getting too dark or I, I want to see less shadows. You can see the, the big difference in shadows as I move this throughout the slider. And the same thing with the highlights. The outside, like the outside is somewhat blown out. So maybe I want to bring those highlights down a bit so I can see it all a little more. It's kind of like removing some of the white. So, you know, that starts to look more contrasty because, you know, since it is, I have less highlights and more shadows. So that looks kind of ridiculous. So, you know, in this case, this looks pretty good. But. I want to move around the corner here back to my door and I'm actually for this I'm going to turn auto exposure off and if I look at the image I I can turn auto contrast on and once I do that it, it balances out a little more but it's still not quite what I'm looking for if for some reason I knew I had no, no light here and I there would not be a light and I had to do this without a light how would I do that well I could really bring some of the shadows back and some of the highlights up but that's about as good as I could do, you know? It's still kind of telling me I need some light, but you can attempt to fix it by bringing the shadows way down. <laughs> or you can just auto contrast, and sometimes that works better. In this case, it's kind of better. Nah, I don't know. Let's go back to our interior shot. Saturation. 
Saturation, if you're familiar with editing pictures or video at all, it is really it's all the color. How much color is in the scene? So if I bring this down below 100, I'll begin to desaturate the scene, which is essentially pulling color out. I'm getting closer to black and white. <laughs> so I can move this saturation all the way down, and I actually have a black and white image. I pulled all the color out of the scene. So this is a good alternative to the white mode, but without it being really white, even though it's, yeah, it is <laughs> technically black and white, it's not just everything white. So I, I, you could maybe put this at like 10%, maybe even 15 to 20%, and you could start to see that there's a little color coming back. I'll put that back at 100, we can see all the color. And once I start to really move this over <laughs> and get this to 200%, this is like double the color. So there's twice as much color that was there before. And this is so unnatural, so absurd. I want to say the, the highest I've ever gone is like 110, 115. And in some cases, it looks really nice. You can, really, you can get particular colors to pop really well this way. Perfect, that's great. Color temperature. Again, this is a video ed or photo editing type of thing also. The color temperature, it generally goes from cool to warm or vice versa, whatever. It's, there's a cool side and a warm side to it. Cool being more blue, whatever. Warm being more red, orange, yellow. So all of that is related to the color temperature. And this number in Kelvin is related to that specifically. You can look up that whole chart wherever you want online. But I just want to move this to the left and right and let you see as I move it to the left, the scene looks more blue. And as I move it to the right, the scene looks more red, orange, whatever. So I'm going to move it to the left. And of course, I've got this backwards. Moving it to the left is going to make it look even more warm it's got that orangey yellowy feeling and moving it to the right is going to make it really more blue looking it looks a lot more blue in this case it's not so bad but there's definitely more blue to the scene beforehand and of course this can apply directly to and with the saturation i could double the saturation when this color temperature changed and make it look absolutely stupid almost like i have the these ridiculous sunglasses on maybe maybe you want that don't know and finally, ambient brightness. <laughs> I've had so much trouble with ambient brightness in the past because I was absolutely convinced that it did nothing. And the way I would test that is put a bunch of lights out, make it dark, like completely black outside, put the sun down. And once I do that, move into an area where there aren't lights, but there's clearly close lights in another room. I would jack this ambient brightness all the way up and nothing would happen. Like, it almost wouldn't work. And I will say there is some noticeable differences now. So I, in my mind, it does work. So the idea is that this increases or decreases the amount of ambient brightness in your scene. So what is ambient brightness? Ambient brightness is all of the light that is not direct and the levels that you would receive from bouncing off of surfaces. So if we look, remember our light view showed that this corner was really dark really dark and that was because there's no direct light hitting that corner at all so it's naturally darker and that makes sense but if we were to affect and increase the ambient brightness that corner in my mind at least in my mind should be brighter and that's because we're actually increasing the ambient brightness the ambient brightness itself and not just the lights themselves so when i do this there's there's minimal that you could see in this scene and I'll try and move to a place where you can start to see a little better even as I move it down all the way you can almost see there's no difference in what we're looking at right here so now what I'll do is I'll actually go let's go up here and in my mind this this area over here is a great candidate for seeing and not seeing ambient brightness because we've got two sides that we could get sunlight from obviously the north side here we're not gonna get much but the south side we have this near direct sunlight and all of the sunlight bouncing off the surfaces here should affect this ceiling in this room pretty well so I've got the ambient brightness at zero so my hope is as I increase this basically to 100% we can see more light just naturally show up in this area because it's considered ambient light so let's increase this let's increase this some more and maybe you can see something, maybe it just barely, maybe barely. It's so hard to see, but I'm I'm gonna still say that this is not working to my liking because it's 
not performing like I'm expecting. Now, maybe I'm missing something. Leave that in the comment section below if I'm just missing something when it comes to the ambient brightness. But really, you should be able to see a lot more difference in the ambient brightness in some of these areas based on changing these values themselves. Let's go back to our interior shot. We'll forget ambient brightness because of what it is, it's just the way it is. So we've got motion blur. This this probably plays more into video and moving around, but as, as you can see, as I move this around, I know you're gonna get annoyed very quickly, but as I move this around, you can see there's blur because I'm moving, you know? I'm moving, there's somewhat of a blur, and that's because the motion blur is set at 50%. If I put this at 100%, you're going to be really mad at me because I'm going to move this around and it's going to be like so blurry. It looks kind of ridiculous. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of this. At least whenever you, you know, you're using Inkscape to walk around and look at your scene, why would you want everything to be so blurry? You have to actually stop moving for this to look normal. So what I do is I put it at 0%. Put it at zero. So literally as I move around, everything looks as it is. It looks static. Nothing is really blurred because I'm not trying to make things look blurred if I'm just moving around and looking at things in my scene. That seems kind of silly to go through that. Again, I would I probably use it to a degree in a video and animation because it applies to that. You know, if you're actually moving the camera, like that's real. So again, I'm gonna leave that at zero for now. Lens flare. Okay, this is just a, an effect. So if we look right here in the center, there's this real kind of it's hard to see, but it's somewhat of a reflection. It's it's kind of a, a round circle here, and really bright, really light, kind of hard to see, but it's just the, the angle from the sun. And it, you've all seen the lens flare effects. You can see it kind of got brighter in this area. And as I come through here, you could really start to see, specifically looking at the sun as I get in this area. I'm gonna put this back to perspective and now we can see my lens flare showing up. There it is right there. There's my lens flare. It's it's, it's working as though I have a lens on my camera and the, the flare I would get from the angle of the sun hitting the angled glass and the lens, all that working together. Again, I'm not a big fan of that unless you're doing some specific video or maybe you want this distinctly in the shot, but I tend to not necessarily want that. I don't need that. It's just going to make the scene look kind of crazy. Now, you know, maybe you want a little more brightness out of your sun, the way you look at it. Great, you could do that. I also prefer to achieve that through bloom. What is bloom? Bloom is, it's the level of which there's kind of like a halo or like a, you know, have you <laughs> ever had the Outback Steakhouse Bloom and Onion? Kind of like that. So it's going to be pulled apart. There's going to be more light around. It's going to be kind of this halo effect around really bright lights. And the best example of this obviously is the sun, but it's going to work on essentially everything. So we look at the sun here and I turn bloom. Bloom is naturally at 15%. And as I increase that, you can start to see really almost more in the reflections from the sun. So if I look over here at this, at the top of this canopy, as I increase the bloom, you can really start to see the level of which I get this kind of blown and like diffused look to it now maybe you like this and this is it looks so ridiculously blown out this at this point because of the bloom so high so I you know again the default is 10 per, or 15 percent that's probably a good place to keep it honestly so you can get just enough so if you put it at zero it kind of looks it looks a little static like you're kind of missing something a little more natural looking because this is, would be a technically reflective surface so I probably put that back to 15 or 20 percent, so you can start to get that little flare coming from that reflective surface. And vignette, I'm not sure why this is set to be on <laughs> as a default, but vignette is, you know, if you've edited an Instagram photo or something like that, the vignette is the the circle or area around on the edges that you can add, either white or black. And so my vignette is currently set at 30. And as I put this all the way up, you can see that vignette significantly increases. I have fairly rarely used this, but I'd probably use it to, again, focus on something specific, but I wouldn't put it at 100%, my gosh. I'd probably, you know, you can see how it's, it's, I only have the option of black, not white, or anything like that. But with the default, default being 30, you could kind of see the corners are a little, little darker, more darker than they would be normally. So if I put that at zero, you could see there's no unnaturally dark area in the corner. 
Whereas if I put it back to 30, there is a little bit. So I might, at the very most, I'd probably put this to you know, 50, 60, if you want some sort of effect. But really, as I get over 60, this starts to look weird, and you can kind of see something weird happening on the edges. I don't know. Chromatic aberration. Depending on the types of glass, you might get a particular aberration or light splitting from white light into separate colors, and kind of rainbowy looking. You can look up chromatic aberration and see exactly what it is, but it's essentially adding that those extra colors split between glass or as light passes through the glass. So by default, it's set at 25%. That's fine. You're not really going to notice that, but as you put it up a lot, depending on the type of glass that you have, again, the number of panes, whatever, you'll start to see more weird colors come into play, specifically around the glass. And there may not even be a good example over here, and it doesn't look like that there is. But just kind of know that it doesn't do a whole lot, but it's technically splitting more of the light into other colors. And I like to <laughs> reduce that because most of the glass in the industry these days, I think they effectively reduce the chromatic aberration by like 98%, most of them 95%, 98%. So like you're never gonna see that, you know. And you know, if you want to put this at 10, 15 percent, great. The default's 25. It shouldn't really be a problem at 25 percent unless you have some specific weird-looking glass. I don't know. But again, there's not a whole lot to see here, and I like to keep it at 25 percent, or maybe just put it down to zero. I don't know. It's really not something you're wanting to be in a presentation, image, video, whatever it might be. Let's move on to atmosphere. This is kind of fun. Looking at atmosphere, I first got white background. And so I can check this and I will get a white background. There's no there's no scene outside, there's no horizon, there's no nothing. I can move outside and look and there's it's just white, you know? Great. Maybe you want that, maybe that's good for what you want, maybe not. I don't know. It might be better than having this, you know, empty horizon with nothing there. I don't know. There's fog, fog intensity. That's kind of interesting. You could put it all the way to a hundred, that's great, but you could barely start to see it as I put it at 100. Some of it kind of fogs up over here, but that's because it's also dependent on the height. So the height it's at 70 meters or like you know 200 over 200 feet. So right now it's that high. So I can move this down, and as I move this down to somewhere where we're standing, we can start to see all of this fog start to invade. Of course, that looks exactly the same almost. Let's move back outside and. There we go. We can start to see some of the fog come into play. The height is starting from the ground plane. So if I set it at one, I won't really see it ever. But if I it's if I put the height way, way high, then that's how high that the fog is impacting. So maybe you only have, you know, 10 feet of fog. So there we go, like the first level. So I don't use fog all that much, but if it does work, definitely works well. And if you're going for that kind of foggy effect outside, it, you can achieve that through the intensity there. So clearly we can make it look fogged outside just by changing all these values. And I'd probably max them out if you want it like super foggy. But again, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of fog. Kind of want things to look normal. Illumination. The, uh, the sun brightness. This. Another bane. Again, the, all the light settings are really the bane of my Enscape experience. And I hope they're not for years. So my my hope is that through this video, it's all understood. It makes a little more sense. So the default sun is actually 80%. Don't ask me why it's not 100. I think it used to be 100. But if we put this at 100, it's a little brighter. I don't know. But again, I'm actually able to scroll up and down. And the increments are moving by 5. So I have the option of moving this all the way up to 300, 400, 500% the light value of the sun so that looks completely stupid absurd and you could you can stack these things on top of each other so I could put the the sun at 500 percent in my exposure at 100 percent and we're at a white image what the heck are we doing so this looks so stupid absurd and pointless so we're gonna go back to where we were I can honestly what I've done a lot of times is I like to start with the sun so maybe I'm maybe I'm working upstairs. Let's go upstairs. There's more direct sunlight, and maybe I want to render this scene right here. So this looks kind of bright, kind of ridiculous. It's clearly the sun. Everything's in direct sunlight. 
But what we want to see is all of this a little clearer. So I'd probably bring the sun down. I'm not afraid to bring it down below 25%. But just notice as you do that, you'll lose some of the like pure white value that you do actually get out of the sun. So if I put this at zero, obviously the sun's off. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't help me at all. There's sun out right now. But if I put this at just 5%, yes, yeah, so I can see the sun, but I'm not, I don't have that white that is of the sun. <laughs> it's almost like it's cloudy, but it's also not cloudy. It's kind of weird. You could achieve somewhat of the same thing with clouds. But I, I, the reason I like to put it at like 20, 25% is that I can get some of that white, but I'm also not losing a lot of the detail, and it's not so much white that I'm losing some of these details in the tile in this case. So if I put this back at 80, you can hardly see the details in this tile because it's just so much white. Okay. Again, I'm gonna put this on auto exposure and we can see how it balances things out. And I need to move around a bit so it'll do that. So yeah, we can see we're looking more for something like this, but I don't want the auto exposure on. I wanna go back to atmosphere. I wanna put this at like, again, probably 30%. It looks nice. Moving on from that, because we're going to come back to sun brightness. Night sky brightness. This is, I'm going to move this sun all the way to night. Okay. <laughs> Where's the sun? <laughs> this is a big knock that I had with Inkscape. Earlier versions didn't have this option at all. And when you put, make it dark, it's just black. It's just like, okay, thank you. I can't see anything. But night sky brightness, I can actually jack this all the way up to the point where uh, apparently I can still see nothing. And that's partly because I have auto exposure off. I can turn it on. Again, this is auto exposure at work. You could see the difference that we saw there. Now everything is auto exposed and everything looks, this looks unnaturally bright because I have auto exposure on, but nonetheless, I can still see things. Turning it off again is, it's just gonna kill the scene because it's completely dark. It doesn't help me at all. But for the sake of night sky brightness, you will need auto exposure on essentially to act, like see the night sky so it'll balance out the scene. So like, yeah, that looks really nice, really nice. So going back to atmosphere, night sky brightness, there we can start to see the night sky come into play, come out of play. Unless you have it at zero, you'll see this, the, the moon. Have it 5%, as soon as you do that, you'll see the moon. I can bring it again all the way back up. I don't quite want it at 300, I'd probably Honestly, I'd probably put it at something like 150, 200 because it, it's nice. Look at that. You can start to see the, the night. Now, if you're looking at a view like this, this looks terrible. You have to affect the light some other way. But for the night sky, it looks really nice this way. Shadow sharpness. This is kind of interesting. You can really start to get some of these shadows more sharp with this value. And again, there's not a whole lot to see with this. And... A lot of times you're not going to see a lot happening, but just kind of know it. if you want more shadow sharpness, that's how you would achieve it. You could kind of look down here and see how sharp this shadow is. I've turned this all the way down, so it's really not all that sharp. It's kind of blurry on the edge, and then move it all the way up. It looks a little sharper, and it's hard to tell, but it is working nonetheless. And moon size. <laughs> this is kind of fun. You know, the moon looks really small. You can always jack the moon up right there. That's completely absurd. Do not do this. Everyone knows that that scale is off. I like to put it somewhere around 300. So it it's kind of, it's, it looks naturally bigger, but not so big where you're thinking like, whoa, what the heck is that? Okay, so artificial light brightness. This is actually a really good scene to look at the artificial light. So the artificial light down here and this is, remember I have auto exposure on, so it's showing me all of, it's trying to balance the black that's outside and the white from these really bright lights that are inside, which is why I kind of get this mixture of both, but I can see everything. So let's start affecting the artificial light brightness. This, is, this has the biggest effect in changing the light of all your interior scenes. So if I, as I bring the artificial light brightness down, it's almost like I'm turning the lights off inside. Clearly, if I, put them at 0%, they're like, for all intents and purposes, they're off. And as I bring this back up, we can really start to see some of these lights come back. And this is where things can get out of hand quickly because they can go way, way, way beyond where they should be. <laughs> they can get really high. So I'm actually going to turn auto exposure off so we can see what this looks like. 
So here we go. These, then this is the exact reason why I like to have auto exposure off if I'm doing a specific rendering. And that's because this is actually the light values and what the lights look like in the dark. Like this is what I should expect it, essentially in real life. I should expect these light levels. It would look more diffused because the ambient brightness would be more natural looking, but nonetheless, this is what we would expect. So if I'm looking at all my lights here, as I bring this up, I can clearly see all these lights get really, really, really bright. Like that's so absurdly bright. I can even go outside and see my house lit up, like way lit up. I'm gonna put this back at 100%. That's what things should look like, a little more like that. So that's fine, but maybe they look a little, maybe you're doing a shot like this, the outside, and clearly it's a little dark, and I would, probably put that up to 120%, 130%. You can start to see everything a little better. It's going to pop a little more. That's artificial light brightness. Go back to the interior, back to my daytime scene, horizon, white ground. So white ground, you've got a bunch of options here. White ground, that's nice. It's just going to be this white ground that we see. Nothing special there. I could do white cubes. This is kind of cool, you know, this this plays really well if you're also doing white mode. Look at this, everything's nice and white. You can get this nice contextual looking white background, it's kind of fun. I'll put this back to none for now, and we can go back to urban. Urban's interesting, you know, it's just like the a city, a random city, it doesn't necessarily matter. You're kind of in a park. All right. We've got town. Again, kind of the same thing. You know, you're just, you're in a town. It looks a little elevated, looks kind of weird, but that's fine. Construction site. <laughs> Maybe you want this on the construction site. I don't know. Interesting. You got some cranes and dirt piled up, whatever around. We also got mountains. This is kind of cool, depending on the location. And forest, you know, this works kind of just if you're out in the middle of nowhere, great. Skybox is really interesting. I don't have an example to show you specifically, but Skybox will allow you to import your own 360 image to, to the point where it will project that image throughout your scene. And that's really great because all of this, it can be rotated. You can actually turn that brightest point on at the sun direction. It's just really nice. You can normalize the average brightness of the value set below. You could you know, basically set the brightness and normalize it. It's kind of like auto exposure, but it's doing that for the whole skybox. I'll have a separate skybox tutorial in the future. Don't worry about that. But it's really nice. I've used skybox in a few different circumstances where I've taken a 360 drone shot from, you know, let's say 200 feet. If we had a tenant lounge at 200 feet, then getting a... 360 drone shot from that location and then adding it to the tenant lounge renderings it makes it look awesome like it's actually <laughs> it's like what it would look like from the space which is just it's so powerful to do that so if you have the capabilities of doing that and putting a skybox in where your site is do that it's awesome it's absolutely awesome and there's also clear and it's just going to look clear almost like you're you fall off and that that's it i like to usually just use white ground so at least there's a horizon but we can also go to town or something like this, and we actually have the option of rotating it. So maybe we don't want to look at this. We can look at the other side, or I don't know. You can just make it look however you want. You know, doesn't doesn't really matter. I'll put it back on white ground for now. So clouds are kind of fun. This is one of Inkscape's cool perks. They they like to play with the clouds. So looking at the clouds up here, my density is set at 50%. That's great. I can make it more dense. You can add so many more clouds if you want. Make it actually a cloudy day. You could have you could change the variety. I do like to put the variety pretty high, so you could actually get a good variety in the types of clouds, but maybe maybe not. Cirrus amount cirrus clouds are the clouds. I don't know exactly how high they are, but they're basically some of the highest clouds in our in the stratosphere in our sky, and they're just gonna add a little more, you know, not quite fog, but they're gonna kind of give you that diffused look. So they're. By default, they're at 50, and that looks kind of weird, but they're all these streaking ones up there. Now, I'll move the density of the clouds all the way down and the variety all the way down, and I'll put the cirrus down. So we, we basically have no clouds in the sky. So as I start to add cirrus 
clouds, serious amount, you can see all our streaking clouds all the way up there. And these are like the high elevation clouds. This is really going to give us all the clouds that we want on a cloudy day. But I also haven't added any lower clouds, which is where our density comes into play. You add both of these together and you can really start to get some layered dimensions into our sky. So I'm actually going to turn auto exposure on for this so we can really start to see this come together. That looks a lot better. So again, if I put the density down, a serious amount down, we just have our sky our, with her sun. Perfect. So I can put the serious amount up. You know, maybe we want this around 10, 15%. The variety of the clouds. We don't see them yet because these are just low elevation. I can put that at 100. And then finally, the density down here. This is really nice. And this is, I'm, this is probably one of the things I'm most impressed with Enscape. But as you move the sun behind clouds, whether you're adding clouds over the sun or you end up moving the sun over clouds, you'll actually receive less direct sunlight, <laughs> which is really cool. And I'm going to leave this in... Uh, auto exposure for this, but I'm gonna add. I want you to look at the sun, and then also look down here at some of these shadow edges. And as I increase the density to the point where the sun is over or the sun is behind the clouds, I will lose. And actually, once this updates, because I'm in it, auto exposure, I will begin to lose. And I need a, actually more a serious amount changed. I can start to lose some of the really that white bright light over here. You can see the kind of the difference. Whereas if I bring all of this down and basically remove a lot of the clouds, that whiteness is brought back because there's more sun reaching my scene, which that is remarkable. I'm <laughs> that's so cool. And it makes so much sense because it's real life. That's what happens. And I applaud them for actually being able to get that in. Contrails are nice. We all know though. We <laughs> Contrails. We know what those are. They're they're all the fun, you know, contrails. You know, from like airplanes. You can have a max of 30 in your scene. It looks kind of ridiculous with 30, so maybe somewhere in 15, 20. That kind of looks fun. I usually keep them around 10. So there's 10 in your scene. Kind of no matter where you look, you can see them at all times. But it's not crazy. Just one more like a depth to it. So. Finally, longitude and lat latitude. You can set this to where you are. That's great. But a lot of times what I end up using longitude and latitude for is not so much setting my location or anything like that. But I want to slide, just ever so slightly adjust the clouds to where maybe they fit somewhere within the sun or not. So again, like I said, you could see that there's a decent amount of white over here because the sun is still visible. But the second I end up moving the clouds over the sun, the light values in my scene actually change. Like, look at that difference. It's awesome. And it's just because there's the sun is actually behind clouds. I, I get to almost do this all day, how fun it is, like, just to see this working in action. So, again, you I end up using longitude and latitude for the specifics of where I want the clouds and what I want the scene to look like from a specific shot. So maybe I'm inside and I actually want a cloudy-looking day and I'm not outside to see that. Well, I can change this to the point where, okay, there's clearly more clouds here. I have less direct sunlight. <laughs> That's awesome. So finally, I'm going to default some of these values again. And let's go to the Capture tab. This should be pretty quick. So the resolution, that's default to Full HD. And you can see the not only the resolution, but the aspect ratio. And this is specifically for when you render out images. So. A lot of times, if I'm doing a quick image, I would probably do full HD. I can't, I've never done HD 10, 24, or window. I've never done that because I want at least full HD. A lot of times, what I'll do is I will use Ultra HD whenever I'm, or basically 4K image when I'm trying to render my image for real, like and sending this to a client. Now, the thing to be wary of is that depending on the result and the size, given the aspect ratio and all that, or given the resolution, you may not be able to email this. It might be too big. If you're sending four or five images, it won't work. If you're sending just one, it will. But just be aware of that. I like to use Ultra because it allows people to zoom in and you not lose that much quality, if any. Show safe frame. I can't say that I've ever actually used this, but this is specifically when you want to basically tell Enscape what you want to look at and what you want to look at, like what you want to 
kind of say, I hesitate to say focus, but like what the intent is. So maybe it's a pillow. I really want this pillow to look good, all that. It's, that's when I would use safe frame. I never really needed to use it in my mind, but that's just me. Image, export object ID, material ID, and depth channel. So this, this is kind of interesting. When you check this, you have the, the option of changing this depth. And of course this doesn't show anything, whatever. It's, it's hard to tell what's happening because really you can't see it. But what's actually happening is it's changing the depth at which it's running this material ID. And this is, this is one of the most valuable tools if you like Photoshop and you like post-processing some of these images out of Inkscape and Photoshop. So what this will do is it will export a second image of the material ID of your scene. And so it, let's say you have this wood floor and you want to make one adjustment in Photoshop to all of this wood floor in your scene. Well, you'd have to select all this area and then this area and then this area. And this. So that's like there four or five different areas to select in this one shot. Well, what material IDs do are allow you to, they will export a second image that you can use as an underlay for selecting purposes with this rendered image. And it will allow you to select individual pieces on top of your other image. So here I am in Photoshop and I'm looking at the rendered image from that same location that we were just looking at. And you can see that Inkscape has went ahead and put in all the trees and people back in. Whatever, that's fine. That'll work for this. But so here's my rendered image. But like I said, maybe we want to make some adjustments to the way this floor looks. So if we look at the other exports here, we've got interior depth, we've got interior material ID, interior object. So again, we've got that depth, material, and object. All the different exports that came that came from my Revit right here. I have the object, material, and depth channel. So when I look at depth, if you're familiar with using alpha channels, that's essentially what this is. It's taking the farthest point black and all the way up to white. It's just, it's, that's the way it's working. If you're familiar with alpha channels, that's what this is. But we are more interested in material ID. And this is really great because not only is this highlighting every material for us, but now we can overlay this onto our finished product. So I, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna duplicate the layer. I am going to put this on top of my other main rendering here. So let's go ahead and I will put this, put the opacity at 50% and we can see what it's starting to do. So what I wanna do now is maybe I wanna change the look of this floor. So I can hit W to go use my wand. I need to select a layer. So let's select the background copy. And I'm gonna put this tolerance at zero just so I know it's selecting only one color. And again, it, they have, it's done this so where we have one color regardless, we have just one color working for us here. So I can select that color right there, boom. S select it there, there, and there, there's my floor. <laughs> really simple could not get any more simple and so now i've got my floor adjusted right there and i can simply go to my adjustments and maybe i want to change the brightness here well i can start to do this just to the floor maybe i want to adjust my brightness to just the floor well i can do that specifically with an adjustment of that selection see i if you look at the mask there I've just selected the floor and I can change the look of that floor very easily just like that. So that's very simple and really easy if you want to adjust and do some post-process work. Really nice, really easy to do that. Again, you could even add your own background. Everything is black, everything black. And something else is really easy. You could select black and then you can right click and choose similar and you're gonna receive every single black perfectly selected. Same will work exactly with the floor. Right click select, boom, I've got my floor selected everywhere because it's all the same color. <laughs> this is so underutilized and it's awesome, really great. And finally, object. This is, yeah, this is kind of interesting, but it's changing every color based on a specific object. So this couch is one object, and so it's showing up as one color. This floor is one object, so one color, you know. This tree is showing up as one color, that's fine. This person, okay, now maybe you want, I would do this if you want to change the specifics of that couch. Okay, I've never really wanted to do that. I kind of want to make it 
based on materials, which is why I would use something more like this. Again, you can see the legs are a different material than the actual sofa itself. Really nice. So let's go back to Inkscape and the settings here. Moving on now, we've got the automatic naming. Automatically name it if you want. Automatically name it if you don't. It doesn't matter. You can change the default folder they want to throw them in. Cool, change it if you want. You do PNG, JPEG, OpenXR, target files. I, big, I'm the biggest fan of PNGs because they are a smaller file size. You don't lose any quality and they have the option of having a transparent background. Like there's nothing more you could want. If you want to use a JPEG, you can, Targa, whatever. Video, this is really great. I went through over this these settings in my video and animation. You can see up in the card right now. But there's not a whole lot to this. It's more really the quality you want of your video. If you want maximum, a lossless, blue, right, whatever, or frames per second. I typically go to 60. You know, if you know you're presenting from a monitor that is at least 120 hertz, choose 120. It's going to look that much smoother, that much better. They're going to enjoy it. You're going to really tell a difference. But I tend to use maximum or lossless, maybe even Blu-ray. It doesn't matter so much. And finally, panorama. You know, you have the option of taking a 360 panorama from your location. And again, just like I would always keep this on ultra, why would you bother not exporting a panorama on high? I just... I don't know, I don't know, some people do it, but, but, but why not keep it on high? I would definitely keep that on high. So finally, I'm gonna go back and reset to default, yes. And finally, I'm gonna run through one last thing that I do as far, like every time I try to set up a scene and set up an image. So if again, if I'm running around, like just looking at stuff, I wanna look at these books, okay, great, you know, not that's awesome, okay. Everything looks good. I'd probably keep auto exposure on, but maybe I want this specific view in two point perspective. I want to get the perfect rendering that I could get, at least in my mind. I want ultra quality. I want to turn auto exposure off. And after that, I really have to start working with the light. And so you're going to have to juggle between the exposure, the contrast of the highlights and shadows the sun brightness and the artificial light brightness. If you can, it's, there's basically, there's, the per, there's a perfect balance of all four of those different values that can give you the perfect result of any rendering with auto exposure off because you want the actual light values. So again, what, what would I do now? I'd probably start with the sun. I want the sun probably down 30 something percent. Let's do 30% for now. And then I'm probably gonna change the highlights, but bring those down a bit. Maybe not quite that much, bring it there. I want more shadows. So let's go ahead and put that, maybe 10, 15%, how about that? Artificial light brightness. Let's go ahead and bring that down to the point where it doesn't look normal, but let's bring this back up and start to bring it up. I probably want this to be a little less than 100% because it, it, things look a little bit too bright considering it it is uh, it's the daytime, <laughs> middle of the day. I don't necessarily need this on so bright or to look so bright. So I'd probably do something like that. And again, you could take this as far as you want and dealing with the clouds, maybe the sun angle you want to change a bit. Not necessarily my angle, the sun angle. You got to hold shift and do this. You can change the sun angle that way. So this is starting to look nice. I want to decrease the density so we can get more natural sunlight in here. So maybe now I want to increase the artificial light brightness. Eh, no, probably don't actually. In this case, what I probably want to do is move the artificial down slightly, maybe to 85, but now I want to increase the sun brightness just a bit. And again, you're not going to be able to see a whole lot because of where the sun is, which is why maybe in the case like this, I mean, I want to brighten it up a little more. So like you really want to see that glare, you know, just something else you can do. I'd probably say this is pretty good, but you know, you could always come back here and adjust some of the highlights to where it's not so blown out. I've had scenes where I've had to bring the highlights all the way down and the shadows nearly all the way down just so I can see what I want, you know, like I don't even have the, I don't quite have the shadows at hundred percent and I like where they are now. Like I, or at 0%. I don't necessarily want them here. It seems too too dark back here. 
So I want to balance it out a little more. And so that's probably better as far as balancing. But if I hit auto contrast, it'll, it'll kind of get cl pretty close to that because it's kind of what I'm after. But this is probably a little bit what I'm after. Again, ambient brightness should do something, but I don't know. So anyways, I'll stop boring you with all the light settings. You're going to have to adjust it. And honestly, I adjust all of these for every single angle that I'm at for every shot because you kind of have to. There's nothing that's real global unless you hit, you know, auto exposure. And if I hit auto exposure here, it's, I don't want this. This is way too bright. You know, like the, the sun's just now coming up. I don't want it to look like this. So anyways, that is it for all the visual settings in Inkscape. And I got, I hope I didn't bore you to death because, you know, that's the way it is. Um, finally, actually, last thing I will say is you're actually able to save these to your project and to a file. I would save these to the project. This is new with 2.7. You can save these to your project. So every time you open this project, you're going to have the option of going through and selecting different settings. You can manage all your presets here. You can even load different ones you have for like different shots if you want to. It's, it's real great. So definitely utilize all the presets and saving presets and saving settings. Do that for sure. So... Again, I apologize for the link, but if you did learn something, please demolish that like button. It really, really helps me out a lot. Also, please consider changing the phase of that subscribe button to existing. That always helps me too. I've got lots more videos coming out in the very near future. Hope you stick around for those. If you have any questions about all these freaking visual settings, leave those in the comments section below. I know this was long. Sorry about that. But I hope you stick around for the next one. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for watching.